Hey guys, it's me, Mr. 250, and welcome back to 999. Hope everyone enjoyed the last episode, I apologize for it being so long, but I figured it'd be over a little faster. And the reason we're right here is because this is the screen that will not have me constantly cycling over and over again. So, there's, a, there's only a few endings left I can get. I believe there's like, there's like three endings, and apparently Coffin... I can't get anymore because we already got the, uh, the, the ending that we just got safe. We just got safe and I want to, uh, to get, so there's basically two endings left. There's the true ending and then there's a knife ending and, uh, I'm going to go for knife ending next. I, there's not a whole lot more, but I, I'm kind of feeling a little completionist about this game. I'm really enjoying it a lot. And, um, so that's the one we're going to go for next, and if I run into any new dialogue along the way, like usual, I'll show you guys, but otherwise, I will see you guys when, uh, when that happens, so be back in a bit. Gotta love the ability to skip text, I mean, seriously, if it wasn't for this, this would be so much more tedious. So there's a little bit of dialogue here, it's not much different, because we hear about it from, uh, from Seven and other playthroughs, and I think possibly later in this playthrough. But Junpei is telling, uh, is telling June here about the Olympic. And I haven't heard about this part yet. They made the Olympic up to look just like the brand new Titanic. And then they sunk it on purpose. They're talking about a conspiracy theory here. Interesting, okay. Retired in 1935? Well, yeah, I guess sometime around then, yeah. I, I didn't know there was this much dialogue. That's why I was just going through it pretty quick. Well, what happened to it after that? I heard it was dismantled. Dismantled? Then it doesn't matter, does it? Whichever boat the real Titanic was, it doesn't exist anymore. It was either retired and dismantled, or sunk in the Atlantic by the curse. But then that would mean the ship is... Wait, what did you just say? Huh? Sank in the Atlantic because of what? The curse. What do you mean a curse? A curse is a curse. This one is the curse of the Egyptian mummy. Now, okay, so yeah, now we know about all this. That's just a tiny little bit of dialogue for making a different decision. And uh, we're going to keep going beyond that. Thanks, but no thanks. It's kind of weird to be getting presents from another dude, you know? Santa's eyebrows went up. Apparently he hadn't thought of that. Well, hmm, I guess you do have a point. I won't force it on you. Sure you don't want it? Um, no, I, I don't want your stupid present. Yeah, I don't want it. Why don't you give it to Lotus? Ah, good idea, will do. Santa turned and headed off to the other room. Hey, you old bag. I just found the perfect thing for a woman in her 40s. He walked into the next room, waving the bookmark. Junpei turned back to his work. Good job. And heard a faint sound from the other room. The sounds of bones breaking. I'm just gonna pretend I didn't hear that. Junpei returned to his search with renewed vigor. There you go. Let's keep going. Okay, so we're back at the uh, the picture here of the abstract image that is actually a dog, but I thought it looked like a man's face. You might notice that there's one odd little, <laughs> odd little choice here at the bottom down here. Fuyar, Fuyan Rapa. <laughs> well, you're like, well, what's a Fuyan Rapa? Well, let me show you. A Fuyan Rapa? See, I mean, this totally looks like one. Here and here. Junpei indicated parts of the picture that looked exactly like the other parts. After three seconds of silence, Lotus looked at Junpei. What the heck is a Fuyan Rapa? What do you mean, what the heck is a Fuyan Rapa? You mean, you don't know? How would I know? How could you not know? That's... That's practically 
Blasphemous. Say you're sorry. Apologize to the Fuyin Rapa. Goodness, you are such a rude woman. Another three seconds of awkward silence went by. Lotus opened her mouth as she shook. Junpei, are you just screwing around? Forget it. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> this is a dog. And there you go. So, <laughs> that's another funny little line of dialogue that I've been wanting to go through for a while, actually, that I was told about. But I haven't had a chance to, so there you go. I, I really liked that one. And it's funny because if you search what is a Fuyin Rafa in, like, Google, you just get people saying, like, you were such a rude person. And how can you not know what a Fuyin Rafa is? And I couldn't figure out what it was. And then I realized it after a while, but it's, it's funny. Oh, this is another funny bit of dialogue here. Um, I ran into this one as well while I was playing through the uh, through the iPhone version, because a lot of these smaller, unimportant decisions the iPhone version just makes for you. So this is one that was on the iPhone version I thought was hilarious. So I accidentally skipped over it, but this is one where uh, they're talking about how uh, I wonder why the dry ice doesn't turn to liquid first, and I think I actually could have skipped this if I just had the code. I didn't actually have to do this, but I'm already halfway in it, so I might as well keep going. But Junpei, however, is not in a mood to discuss science. How would I know, and how is that going to help us get out of here? We don't have time for this crap. <laughs> Actually, Junpei stopped mid-sentence, surprised by June interjection. Under enough pressure, carbon dioxide will turn into a liquid. This isn't really a good time for chat about science. But I was wondering the same thing. Wondering what? Wondering why carbon dioxide doesn't turn into a liquid unless it's under pressure. Right? It just seems weird. Water's a liquid between 32 degrees and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So why isn't that the case for carbon dioxide? H2O and CO2 are pretty similar. No, they're not. <laughs> they're totally different substances. Look, guys, if we keep this up, we're just gonna freeze to death. You go to that, you wanna die talking about sublimation and gases? Because I sure don't. He fixed both of them with a glare. Now, let's get back to work. Assuming you don't want to end up like a pair of ice sculptures. Junpei turned around, the problem dealt with. Or so we thought. There's a kind of ice that doesn't turn into liquid when it goes above 32 degrees. I heard about it. Its melting point is 96 degrees. And we've already heard about this. But it won't let me skip it, so there must be a little bit different, a little bit different stuff here. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it was strange, but no, Junpei told himself it didn't matter. Their first concern needed to be leaving the freezer, or none of them would be around to ponder scientific quandaries for very long. He did his best to pretend he heard nothing and resumed his investigation of the room. Okay, so that's that part's done. I'm gonna go back to doing this. Okay, so what we're doing for this route, just to have everyone up to speed, is uh, we're going for the knife ending, which I've been told you get by choosing door 6 and not getting 5, 8 before it, which I think means if I get anything but 5 and 8, like 4 and 8, I think that'll work as well. I think. So I'm going for, uh, I went for 4 the first time, in case you didn't know, and I'm going for, as you can see, 8 for the second one, and then when we get the option of choosing uh, the third set of doors, I'll go with door 6, and that should hopefully get me that ending, so we're gonna go that way, just so everyone knows. Thought I'd do a little update here and let everyone know where we're at. Okay, so here's another little bit of interesting dialogue, and uh, I also saw this one in the iPhone version, but I thought it was actually kind of funny. Um, and apparently, you don't get this if you go through door... If you go through door 5 and then door 8, you don't you don't get this one, you get the one we already got, but because we're going from door four than door eight, we get a slightly different bit of dialogue here. So, uh, this is when she's hack or not hacking, but she's writing a program on the computer. Lotus grinned, pleased with herself. Well, at any rate, that was pretty amazing. Did you fall for me again? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean, again? I'm not into you. I know, I know, don't be so stubborn, shy boy. I'm not being stubborn. I'm not shy and I'm not a boy. I'm a young, healthy 21-year-old man. I'm not going to fall for an old lady like you. <laughs> Those eyes. When I first saw them, I thought they were photoshopped and I realized they were part of the game. <laughs> Suddenly, the guttural roar of a furious animal filled the room. 
Or so Junpei thought, just for a moment. Lotus's hand suddenly stopped, and her shoulders stiffened. Old lady. Did you just say, old lady? Ah, crap, thought Junpei. I went too far. Oh well, it was a nice life, while it lasted. I've had enough of you. Go somewhere else. You're bothering me. What? Go see if you can find a password hint, or something. I'll try and open this from here. You're distracting me. Go. Now. Lotus waved her hand in the universal gesture of dismissal. Junpei was clearly not wanted. Time to cut my losses, Junpei thought, and left as quietly and inoffensively as he could. Junpei wandered around the room for a while, looking for anything that might help find the password for the computer. Unfortunately... And he can't find it, and I think that might be where the new dialogue ends. No clues, whatever. He asked Clover if there was anything useful in the laboratory, but her answer was a no. Dang, he thought. Looks like we've hit a dead end this time. But just as he was about to tell Lotus that his search had returned nothing... Bulza, Junpei, I did it! <laughs> Excited cheering erupted from near the monitor. He hurried back to find Lotus looking rather smug. I'm still trying to skip the text, so it's not it's still new. The strange text before him was gone, and its place was something entirely different. Okay, well you already you've already seen this, so I'll i I'll cut here. Okay, okay, this actually seems kind of relevant to the story a little bit. So right here, um now this is uh this is right after they after Jude Pei completes the puzzle. Clover calls him over, and at this point, normally, she tells Junpei about how, how, uh, how her brother doesn't have a real arm. He says, what's up? Um, well, never mind. Hey, hold on a minute, what does- sorry, just forget about it, it's nothing. Before he could say anything else, she spun around and ran back down the stairs. What was that? After waiting a few minutes to see if she would return, Junpei sighed and shook his head and went back to searching. Now that, that is important. Because... The only way that he was able to figure out that Ace, I mean, the only real, like, method that sparked everything, that Junpei was able to figure out that Ace was actually the killer, was because he, uh, now what is it, was because he knew that Snake's arm wasn't real, and he saw the Ulna, and he's like, hey wait, that's a real arm. He doesn't know that information this time, which would basically hamper his ability to have, to know what Ace is. And I'm sure that's going to negatively affect, you know, Junpei in the form of death, probably. Is this lack of knowledge. So let's continue and see what that results in. Okay, this must be new dialogue. I don't know what they're talking about, but it let it stopped skipping dialogue. We found the key we needed. The key. Ain't that what I just said? I'm talking about the Jupiter key. We found it in the operating room. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to click that. Here, Seven tossed something small and metallic towards Junpei. He caught it and found that the object was a key. We already know about this. I'm wondering if there's anything important other than this. Like, because we already, we already know about this. So why won't it let me skip it? Alright, so uh, at this point I'm going to go for door six. And uh, we're going to skip through all of those. And if I find uh, where we need to... You know, where it starts to deviate, then I'll come back then. But otherwise, we'll just uh, skip through all this as well. Okay, it's making me stop skipping here, so there must be another thing here. This is right after we uh, lowered the winch, because we couldn't raise it in uh, the engine room. Junpei and Ace followed him. Okay, so... Since, I mean, we're already, we're already on track for the knife ending, because we can't really make any more decisions to get us off the track. So it looks like when you don't learn about, because I was thinking about it, when you don't learn about, uh, when you don't learn about his arm, you don't get a chance to look at the arm later and you know discover that hey, it's uh, it's not his arm. And I think the reasoning behind that was because you weren't with Snake in the first place, and because you weren't with Snake in the first place, you didn't ever quest, you didn't ever like have any possible information to give her about him. So that, that's one thing, and for whatever reason, Santa doesn't tell you about the rat puzzle here. Which, that, pu that kind of seems like an important puzzle to know about. Just in terms of the uh, morphogenic field. 
I believe it was called. But, uh, just a little something I noticed. Let's keep going. Okay, now this is another, uh, change in the story. Uh, Santa actually has a different story here, and it, it, once again, in the iPhone version, it gives you the different story. So this is the story of the two Santa Clauses. It's a little bit different than, and a little bit, uh, I kind of find it funny, but a little creepy at the same time. It goes that a long time ago, there were two Santas. One of them wore white, and the other wore black. The white Santa gave presents to good kids. And the black Santa played tricks on bad kids. Totally not racist. They went on like that for a while, but eventually the black Santa's tricks started to get worse and worse. Pretty soon, the white Santa couldn't stand it anymore. And he stabbed the black Santa to death. When he stabbed the other Santa, the white Santa got blood all over his clothes. And that's why these days his clothes are red. You could say that red is all that's left of the black Santa. Junpei was silent. He could think of nothing to say. To that creepy story, June was staring at Santa, sadness plain in her face. He continued. I wonder, what Santa I am? The white Santa or the black Santa? And there you go. So that's a little bit of a different story. And I was talking to my friend about this and they say that that's kind of funny. And that it actually kind of has some story importance. So maybe we'll figure out if that actually means something later. Okay, it stopped me here again. So this is the point where we're putting all the cards into the boxes. Ace says, I'll leave the rest to you. And that's where it stopped me from skipping. He quickly turned and walked away. Strange, Junpei thought. Oh well, whatever. Doing his best to clear his mind for the task at hand, he turned back towards the boxes. It was time to solve the puzzle of the nine boxes. Nine cards with nine pictures, okay. So, this was a little bit different in that... I'm not sure if it means a whole lot, but... I just, out of out of trying to do the puzzle as fast as possible, I never looked at this fence. And... Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if that meant anything, but I don't know why June didn't trip this time. Because in the previous room, she had that fever thing still, like even in this playthrough, she still had that fever thing that bothered her. So I'm wondering why she didn't trip this time. I think that was more to, uh, to go, to skip over the fact that you don't know that Ace has, uh, the ability not, or the lack of ability to recognize faces. And it doesn't get emphasized this time is the thing, so you still don't really know about that. In addition, in addition, Lotus doesn't tell you about that, uh, that disease or whatever it is. So you don't even know to think about that. So that's another thing about this. Okay, it stopped me here, and this might be where we pick up, or we might do something different. I'm not sure, but this was the main, like, turning point in the last one. Because this is where we found, we took a second look at Snake and realized, hey, that's an arm, that can't be Snake. So, and it stopped me here, so let's continue from here. She's not here. No, she isn't. They searched a little longer, but with no luck. They couldn't find Clover. Finally, they gave up and left the central hospital room. Instead of checking the shower, and that's the key reason there. Slowly, they made their way back to the hallway. At last, they reached the stairs, and Junpei spoke. All right. I'm thinking we should probably split up. That's how you die, Junpei. I'll head back to the stairs and take the elevator down to E-Deck. June, you can take the stairs up to B-Deck. Alright. That sounds bad. Good. But, um... What? Could you stop calling me by that code name when we're alone? Huh? Oh, uh, sure, right. Um, I'll, uh, do that. There was a reason Junpei pers persisted in calling her June, even when they were alone. Although, perhaps not the best reason. He was embarrassed to call her by the nickname he'd used when they were children. Canny. Nine years ago it came naturally. After all, they were children. Have we heard this music? I like this music. But now that they were adults, it felt... strange. Regardless of what he might hope for, to call a woman he wasn't dating by such a childish nickname felt odd to him. Of course, to call her Miss Kurashiki would 
be even more awkward, and simply Kurashiki would seem a little brutesque. And although he couldn't put his finger on why, he felt somewhat forward to call her Kane when they hadn't seen one another for so long. In short, it was simply easier for him to call her June and leave it at that. Alright, I'm going then. Yeah. Be careful, Canny. June, or perhaps more appropriately, Canny, blushed and smiled. You be careful too, Jumpy. Yeah. Got it. Take care. Junpei looked after her, for, after her for a moment as she ran up the stairs, then turned around and took off for the hallway. I'm just waiting for him to get, like, you know, stabbed. Something bad happened to him. This is where, yeah, on those stairs is where all those people died. It seems a little suspicious. Wait, wait, let me think, let me think. The story would also have to be different, because we're assuming if we don't find the safe, that the safe doesn't get found. I mean, maybe it could, but I'm assuming it doesn't. Would that mean that he never he never even left the plates in the doors? There's an idea. Tragedy always strikes when one least expects it. But to wait for a man to stand before striking him down seems almost crueler than dealing the fatal blow when he lies in the ground. A light in a dark place. June's smile had given him hope. Both for escape and... possibly for something else. It was that hope that raced his spirits just enough that they might soon be fully dashed. He opened the elevator door, and there she was. A woman sat, slouched against the wall. Lotus. Junpei felt his blood turn to ice. Her body was limp, and her skin smooth and pale as always. Oh, hey there. Was covered in bright red blood. Junpei felt his cheek constrict. Chest. He couldn't breathe, and his legs began to shake. A slow, cold drop of sweat trickled down his back. He felt his stomach somersault. Junpei's mind went blank, all his thoughts replaced with endless, hissing white. Driven by little more than instinct, he began to walk towards the lotus slowly. Each slow movement of his stiff limbs brought him closer to her corpse. Finally, he stood next to her. Robotically, he bent down and put his hand against her neck. There was no pulse. No rise and fall of breathing. She was slightly warm. Something, somewhere in Junpei's shaken mind told him that meant she had been killed recently. Yes, Junpei thought, his mind slowly returning. She had been killed. Someone had killed her. There was a deep cut on the left side of her chest. Blood still oozed from it, although clearly her heart had stopped beating some time ago. The weapon had been a knife, then? Perhaps she had been stabbed in the heart, once. She would have died immediately. He, he took little comfort from knowing she must have suffered very little. Only then did Junpei notice. Lotus's bracelet was gone. Okay. So what I'm guessing, just a little bit of guess, is that all Ace didn't even have to kill, he didn't even have to kill Clover this time. All he did... Because at this point, you know, he's like a mastermind. No one knows anything about him. He picked up the nine bracelet. Maybe they did leave the door propped open. I don't know. Maybe that's how he got it. But he picked up the nine bracelet, stabbed her, stole her bracelet, didn't even have to make a scene, left her here, and he's probably already off the ship by now. Lastly, let us discuss how to remove the bracelets. One, you escape from the ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. Which we've heard a few times already. Shut down automatically. Was that why the killer had ended Lotus's life? So that they might have the number 8 bracelet? I mean, it's easier just to kill her with the knife that he got from uh, the ninth man than to have to, you know, worry about grabbing the gun and... Well, I mean, maybe he still has the gun, but... Then having to worry about, you know, dealing with Lotus. Just kill her and it's over with. If that was true, then the killer was whoever wanted the number 8 bracelet. Perhaps, more accurately, the person who would gain the most by obtaining bracelet number eight. Who is that? Who would benefit the most from the number eight bracelet? The thought only entered Junpei mi Junpei's mind when... Ooh! There goes Junpei. He heard a noise. 
a sound like a sharp knife cutting through wet meat. It struck him as strange that the noise came from inside his own body. A moment later, the pain hit him. It wasn't merely pain. There was heat, extreme heat as well. He felt as though molten iron had been splashed against the side of his body. Finally, his brain made the connection. He had been stabbed. But where? His body was quickly going numb. He couldn't tell where the knife had met his flesh. Given the circumstances, however, he had most likely been stabbed in the back. Whoever had killed Lotus now had done the same to Junpei as well. Ugh. His voice was little more than a weak groan. With what little strength he had left, Junpei turned his body, trying to catch a glimpse of his attacker. Ugh. But as he did, the knife dug itself in deeper, twisting viciously. Ugh. He collapsed to the floor, a puppet with its strings cut. His arms and legs lay where they fell, oddly twisted and awkwardly positioned. Junpei's body was entirely numb. He could feel the bud leaking out of him, but nothing would move. Nothing, save his eyes. As he lay on the floor, his life ebbing away, Junpei finally saw his attacker. Two tiny images of the killer reflected in his eyes. With that recognition came... nothing. He felt no emotions, not anger, not sadness, not regret. The, pa the paralysis that had claimed his body had reached his mind. His killer glanced down at his body. Then, without a word, climbed into the elevator and was gone. His eyesight began to fade. The world grew blurry and began to dissolve into an empty white fog. The fog crept into the edges of his mind and worked inexorably inward. Soon, it swallowed up the last that remained of Junpei's mind, and his consciousness left him. There was nothing more. Into utter emptiness he fell. Into zero. Whatever Junpei had been was gone. And there you go. So, for you guys, I know that was a little bit of a bad, <laughs> bad end. It was a little bit of a short episode, probably. But I just kind of wanted to clean up this ending, and I know it didn't add a lot to the story. I understand that. I, I still enjoy getting the ending, regardless. I'm a little sad I couldn't get the coffin ending. I know it doesn't add anything, and you know, I, I'm talking to my IRL friend about the game, and they're like, oh, you don't, need to, you don't need a coffin ending, you already got that. I'm like, but I still want it. You know, so whatever. But that's okay. And I believe the only ending we have left to get is the, uh, is the true ending. And I've gone, uh... I've shown all the things that I know about that are interesting. Uh, this episode was showing this ending and showing some of the other interesting things I ran into. I can't think of anything else. If anyone has anything else I need to pick up along the way, let me know. But otherwise, I believe our next path... If I pull it up really quick, hold on. Okay, our next path will be door 4, then door 7, then door 1. That leads to the true ending, which is what we want. And I'm just going to save here because I'm pretty sure the data saved... So we got the knife ending. I'm still a little sad that I can't get that coffin ending. I'm going to go to this preview screen so I can talk for a moment. So if there's anything else I need to pick up before that, or if there's anything along the way that I need to get while going for the uh, the true ending, let me know anything I need to pick up. Like I was told, let's see, I was told I should, if I come across a room with a bunch of pipes, I should keep checking them because that can lead to some funny dialogue. Um, I don't know what the room is. I was told that it would be spoilerish if I was told the room. So I'm not sure what the room is. But I will look out for that. If there's any other places I need to go, let me know. Uh, I don't mind playing through the game again if it's a playthrough that's not compatible with the true ending. But other than that, I think that's about all I've got here. Uh, so next time, and because I know, I know actually that this last true ending is much, much longer than all the other endings. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of story in there as well. So I will, I'll have to try to get comfortable with making 30 minute videos again instead of trying to make two hour videos. Uh, but anyway, hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching. And next time we will begin our path towards the true ending, probably starting in the hospital room. Because I believe the operating room will be the first room we haven't seen in that path. 
and I don't know anything about it, and I'm kind of excited. So, thanks for watching. Bye!